Manchester United in the early 2000s were on top of the footballing world. They had gone from the historic class of 92, names like Beckham, Scholes, Giggs, the Neville brothers. They were one of the few teams who gracefully transitioned into the next generation, with new stars like Wayne Rooney, Cristiano Ronaldo, and Carlos Davy, all under the watchful eye of the master, Sir Alex Ferguson. During his 26-year reign as manager, Manchester United would experience an unrivaled run of dominance. He won 38 trophies, a haul that included five FA Cups, two Champions League final wins, and 13 Premier League titles, knocking Liverpool off their perch. He even got the storybook ending, with Fergie's final season sending him off with a record-breaking 20th league title. When Sir Alex Ferguson left Old Trafford, Manchester United was considered the most prestigious jewel in English football history. And since then, the ownership has allowed the club to be turned into a cheap tourist attraction. I mean, literally, Old Trafford is rusting. Just look at the BS the fans have to put up with. Come on, how could the most dominant team that English football has ever seen become a second-rate club in about a decade? All the while, their biggest rivals would not only become the dominant forces in England, but of all of Europe. How could Manchester United fall so quickly? Well, ladies and gentlemen, in this video, I'm gonna do a deep dive, tell you how this all came to be. How negligent ownership turned the greatest football club the world has ever seen into a decade-long laughingstock. This is the story of the fall of Manchester United, the post-Ferguson years. Now to fully understand how we got here in 2021, we actually have to go back to the twilight years of Sir Alex Ferguson. Now an easy narrative to say is that they've suffered the fate of, of many sports giants that have come before. The loss of an iconic manager, especially someone as transcendent as Sir Alex Ferguson, can have a devastating effect on a team for quite a while after. It can take years, if not decades, to replace someone of that magnitude. And while on the surface, it, it kind of looks that way. But truthfully, the cracks were already starting to show even before Sir Alex Ferguson had left. And the true start of the fall of Manchester United began unsurprisingly with the selling of the club to the Glazer family. Now, who are the Glazers? To understand how Manchester United got here, you need to understand their owners. And for that, I highly recommend Rabona TV's video that goes into a deep dive on how the Glazers have economically wrecked havoc on this club with the help of their clever money man, Ed Woodward. It's a fairly complicated web of banking and economics and frankly stuff that I'm not the most qualified to get into. But the Spark Notes version is essentially the Glazers, with the help of Ed Woodward, were able to slowly buy out controlling interest in the club by 2005. They did this controversially by taking out loads against the club. What that means is they bought Manchester United on a credit card with money they didn't have and sky high interest rates. And once they gained control of the club, they used Manchester United's money, not their own, to pay off the credit card bill, plus interest. Essentially turning Manchester United into the Glazers family bank account. Now this has always been a point of contention with fans because the theory was the Glazers were taking money out of the club to pay off their sizable debts instead of reinvesting into the club via player recruitment. A fear that came to fruition only a couple years into the Glazer ownership when Manchester United would sell off two of their fan favorites in Cristiano Ronaldo and Carlos Tevez in the summer of 2009. Well, technically, they didn't even sell Tevez, he just left. Both were world-class players approaching the prime of their careers. Both of them would go on to insanely successful careers after Manchester United, and Manchester United would turn around and spend the record-breaking 80 million that they received for Cristiano Ronaldo and replace him with 20 million Antonio Valencia. And let's be real, Antonio Valencia had his moments, but he never got anywhere close to Carlos Tevez in quality, let alone a Cristiano Ronaldo. And also, it begs the question, where did the other 60 million go? And Sir Alex Ferguson himself complained for months after the record sale of Cristiano Ronaldo that he was never given the funds to reinvest into the transfer market. He just never saw that money. Now, despite the departure of Ronaldo and Tevez, the team was still very good, but not nearly as dominant. They still retained the powers of a prime Wayne Rooney and the backline of Evra, Vidic, Rio Ferdinand, and Edwin Van Nassar in net, while a bit past their primes, were still one of the best defenses of that era. But they would finish runners-up in the 2009-2010 season, losing the league to Chelsea by one point. But they would respond by winning a record-breaking 19th English title in the following season, a number most significant because it finally surpassed Liverpool's 18th, fulfilling the prophetic promise that Sir Alex Ferguson had made long ago when he first took the job. He had finally knocked Liverpool off their perch. 
And he wasn't done yet, as this season would also see a return for Manchester United to the Champions League final, where they were absolutely played off the pitch by an all-time Barcelona side featuring Messi, Iniesta, Xavi, and David Villa scoring this beauty. Man, this goal crushed me as a kid. It's traumatizing watching it back. Fuck you, David Villa. It was a loss that made it painfully obvious how much they missed the firepower of a Cristiano Ronaldo or even a Carlos Tevez. Moving on to the next season, the fight to win the Premier League title came down to the wire once again. On the final day, Manchester United had secured all the points to retake the lead in the race for a 20th league title. All they had to do was wait to hear the results from the QPR versus Man City game. And well, you you know what happened next. Balotelli, Aguero! Yeah, the most iconic moment in Premier League history is simultaneously the most traumatizing moment for any Manchester United fan who weren't alive during the Munich disaster. And honestly, this might have been worse. What happened in Munich was a tragedy, but Manchester United fans didn't need to relive that tragedy every goddamn time they play a commercial for the Premier League for the next five years. Especially in America, oh my god, every commercial with the Premier League would end with <laughs> But yeah, um, two stoppage time goals allowed Manchester City to win their first Premier League title, and if you're not a Manchester fan, you could probably guess how brutal it was to lose this dramatically, giving your crosstown little brother rival its first Premier League title ever. Like yeah, it, that was bad enough, but that knife is twisted just so much deeper if you had been following the transfer sagas over the past three summers. Now to give you a little recap, okay, 2009, we already talked about it, was the departure of Cristiano Ronaldo and Carlos Tevez. That same summer, Man City ended up buying Tevez for 32 million from West Ham. While Manchester United's biggest purchase that summer, Antonio Valencia, for 20 million. Now let's move on to the summer of 2010, where Manchester United were linked with a little Spaniard from Valencia all year. His name? David Silva. Oh yeah, you might have forgotten this, but there was news article after news article, rumor after rumor, linking the attacking midfielder to Manchester. And they were all right, except it was the wrong Manchester. He ended up signing for Manchester City that season for 31 million. You wanna know Manchester United's biggest signing that summer? Can anybody remember who was the biggest sign for Manchester United in the summer of 2010? Do you remember Man United lighting $10 million on fire for Bebe? You remember Bebe? Yeah, that Bebe. Also, I'd like to point out for context that David Silva wasn't even the biggest signing for Manchester City that summer. He was the fourth biggest signing for that summer alone. Behind Edin Dzeko, who came in for 40 million, Yaya Torre, who was 33 million, and Mario Bellatelli, who was 32 million. Manchester City got all of that in one summer. And the summer after selling Cristiano Ronaldo, Man United got Bebe. And then we have the summer of 2000 and 11 and this one personally hurt me because i was tracking these rumors of manchester united looking to add a little firepower to this team and they were linked with this little argentinian killing it for atletico madrid that season it was basically the same song and dance as david silva throughout the year and then summer rolls around and boom 44 million for sergio aguero to manchester city and his first season there well the rest is unfortunately history Manchester United's biggest purchase during that summer was 27 million for David De Gea. Not, not bad, okay? But you could see how Manchester United fans could get a little jealous. Both the Glazers and Sheikh Mansour were new owners. But from there, you could clearly see a divergence in the two. One was very generously investing in player talent, while the other seemed more occupied with paying off debts. Debts that, let me remind you, they brought on the club in the form of $62 million in interest payments per year. Hmm, 62 million? And you sell Cristiano Ronaldo for 80, and then your most expensive player is 20 million, leaving you 60 million left over that Sir Alex Ferguson never got to see. I wonder where that 60 million went. Hmm, guess we'll never know. But I mean, just look at the spending over these past three suburbs. And if you had to guess which one of these owners were broke and which one of these owners had oil money, come on, come on. Now here's the crazy thing. As an American, I have a slightly different perspective 
on the Glazers because I, I knew them first as the owners of the Tampa Bay Bucks, an NFL franchise that has won two Super Bowls under their ownership, one in the early 2000s and now one this past year. And yes, during that 2004 to 2008 period, they were notoriously cheap. Dead last, 32 out of 32 in money spent on players in the NFL. A reminder that they bought Manchester United in 2005. So the running theory in the American press at the time was that the Glazers were saving all the money that they could on both of their franchises in order to pay off the massive interest debts that they were accruing at Manchester United. So all evidence kind of points that during this era, the Glazers were some broke ass billionaires. But, and I don't know if this is more of a commentary on NFL owners, Compared to all the other owners of NFL franchises in America, there are actually people far, far worse than the Glazers. They don't interfere too much, at least, and they are capable of putting people that know what the hell they're doing in place. There are many NFL franchises who have never even sniffed near a Super Bowl, let alone one two. And just this past year, they splashed the cash to sign arguably the greatest player of all time in Tom Brady. And from that point, they opened up their checkbook to bring in all the top free agents that they could and it all worked out. It carried them to a Super Bowl win. And then this upcoming season, they have somehow brought back damn near every single starter to make a consecutive run at a Super Bowl. And that's something that is basically unheard of during the salary cap era in the NFL. So objectively, they are capable of running a championship winning sports franchise. So how the hell did they fuck up Manchester United so much? How could they get one sport so right and one sport just completely utterly wrong? Now, there are probably a number of complex reasons for this, but I think the biggest difference is that in the NFL, you're required to either have a general manager or a head coach make all the personnel decisions. And then you have a completely different division for commercial deals. Now in English football, there's a similar position held at many clubs called the sporting director or director of football. Someone who theoretically is probably highly experienced, has an adept understanding of transfers and roster construction. And what's interesting is at least during the early days and up until I believe this past year, under the Glazer ownership, have never appointed a director of football or a sporting director at Manchester United. And even more mind boggling is that the man who they would eventually put in charge of these duties was, let's be honest, an accountant. Yeah, for some reason for Manchester United, they thought let's take the money guy and also make him in charge of rebuilding an aging bloated roster, a job that a highly experienced director of football would find daunting. Let's have an accountant learn on the job here. That was their strategy. And it's just mind baffling to be that the Glazers or Ed Woodward never appointed someone in charge who actually had some experience with football. Come on, this is Manchester United, not Leeds. his team punching above their weight. So when Fergie gave him his personal stamp of approval, there was a bit of optimism. Plus, the team was pretty much the same. We just won the league. How bad could it be? Oh no. Oh, oh no. Oh god no. Oh god no. Oh god no. Oh, oh no. Oh no. Oh god no. God no. Yeah. Um. A footballing genius, he was not. Very soon, it became apparent that this Manchester United team was being held together with duct tape and paper clips. The roster, even after selling major players like Ronaldo and Tevez, were never able to replace that level of talent, and the majority of their best players were getting up there in age. 
and David Moyes, who was very comfortable in the role of underdog, seemed to have no clue how to play the bully. Manchester United, who one season ago was this unstoppable offensive titan, almost inexplicably became an elephant afraid of mice, regularly dropping points to inferior teams. Now, following up Sir Alex Ferguson was always going to be a near impossible task, but let's be honest, David Moyes had no chance. And the signs were all there from the beginning because this was the first summer that Ed Woodward would become in charge of transfers. And it was a horror show. He spent the whole goddamn summer chasing after Sex Fabregas like he was a high school crush, but his ass ends up moving to Barcelona in mid-August, leaving Ed Woodward with nothing to show that summer but his dick in his hand. And his response was he ended up panic buying Marion Fellaini, which was an, an old favorite over at Everton for David Boys. But Sex Fabregas, he was not. But Ed Woodward loved panic buying so much that he, he just had to go back to the well in January when he overpaid again for an aging Juan Mata. Now Juan Mata in his day was a fantastic player. He's a fantastic human being. Just look at him. He's the human embodiment of a real life Care Bear. But when they bought him, he was very clearly past his prime. And needless to say, neither of these signings helped out. So when Robin Van Persie ended up getting hurt that season, it turned into a car wreck. Man United's first season after Sir Alex Ferguson's retirement was an unmitigated disaster. They would finish a shocking seventh place in the Premier League just a year after winning the title. David Moyes was signed the day after Sir Alex Ferguson retired to a six-year contract. He wouldn't even make it the year. He was sacked after just one horrific season where Man United failed to qualify for the Champions League or Europa for the first time since 1990. Ryan Giggs took over as interim manager to see the rest of the season out, which honestly, the lone highlight was when he substituted himself into a game <laughs> late in the season. That's how sad that season was for Man United fans. This was the one positive memory that I have from the season. <laughs> but then, on May 28th of 2014, tragedy struck. The patriarch of the Glazer family, Malcolm Glazer, died. Oh, she passed away? Oh. Mm. All right. Oh, come on. He was a billionaire who died at 85. He lived a better life than any of us could ever dream. And he did it on the dime of Manchester United. I'm sure he's sitting fine at a penthouse apartment in hell right now. So moving on. Next up on the manager carousel was one Louis Van Hall. He would be announced as a new manager, and he came with a far more accomplished CV than his Scottish predecessor. He had won titles coaching at Barcelona, Bayern Munich, and had even won the Champions League with Ajax. And at the time of the hiring, he was currently coaching a surging Netherlands side at the 2014 World Cup. So on paper, it looked pretty good. He had the experience with bigger clubs. He already had a good relationship with Robin Van Persie. At least this is what the narrative the media spun. And to be fair to Ed Woodward, he did not go cheap this summer. Whatever debts or financial woes that seemed to be hamstringing the end of the Sir Alex Ferguson era were nearly negligible by 2014. They had done this by cleverly refinancing their high interest rates, which used to be nearly $60 million per year. They negotiated that down to around 20 million. While during the same time when they first took over at Manchester United, the revenue was around 157 million. But by 2015, they had increased their profits to 400 million a year. So shit on the Glazers and Ed Woodward all you want, and rightfully so, but when it came to making money, they were pretty fucking good. Let's be honest here. But not qualifying for either the Champions League or Europa League, that was a huge, huge dent in the sweet multi-million dollar deals that you get from TV revenue. So reinvestment was now necessary, and the Glazers shelled out that checkbook, bringing in massive signs like Angel Di Maria, who at the time broke the British transfer record at something like 60 million, as well as other big names like Memphis Depay, Daily Blind, Anthony Martial, and we even got a little bit of deadlay drama signing Romanel Falcao, and nearly all of this would be wasted money. While these were expensive and talented players, Manchester United's most pressing need at the moment was a midfielder, and Ed Woodward got stuck pulling the same shenanigans as he had done in summers past. This time, instead of chasing Sex Fabregas all summer, he ended up chasing Thiago of Barcelona, who we let slip through his fingers and would eventually end up at Bayern. It was also reported that Atletico Madrid Saul, a fantastic midfielder, was reportedly available to them for only 8.5 million. But the deal was nixed because LVG wasn't familiar with the player and they never really filled that hole in midfield. So when you fast forward to midway through the season and you see your most expensive signing in Di Maria lining up as a center midfielder, well, you know it's all gone horribly wrong. Worse still was it seemed like LVG's favorite offensive tactic was to pass the ball sideways back and forth across the pitch. And when the defense least expected, it, they passed the ball sideways again. They never saw it coming. And neither did the fans, who went from hyper-offensive football under Sir Alex Ferguson to Louis Van Hall, 
a cautious, rigid side, more afraid of making mistakes than playing to win. So while the CV was longer than David Moyes, honestly, he didn't fare much better. In fact, if you take a look at the stats, their win percentages was actually about the same. Moyes actually scored more goals. And this is all made more depressing as Manchester City would slowly emerge and become the most dominant force in English football during this era. And they did it playing far more attractive attacking football. Sadly, Louis Van Hall's time at the club was much like his time on the pitch. It just felt like a lot of sideways passing. The most entertaining moment from his tenure at the club was this, glorious. And I guess he, he gave Marcus Rashford his debut, so, so that wasn't terrible. But yeah, it just wasn't working with him and LVG gracefully and thankfully retired again at the end of the 2016 season. So Manchester United, once again, was in the search of a new manager. But this time, it would kind of seem like their hands were forced, or at least heavily influenced, by the moves of their noisy neighbors. But you gotta remember, in the summer of 2016, Manchester City would announce in a blockbuster move that they would be bringing in one Pep Guardiola next season. One of the greatest, if not the greatest, manager of football of all time. And with that appointment, Manchester United kind of had no choice. Their hands were tied. They had to bring in the only man who occasionally foiled him during his time at Barcelona. You know him oh so well. He is the Gary Oak to Pep's Ash Catcher. Of course, I'm talking about the one, the only, Jose Mourinho. Now, Jose at the time was still regarded as one of the best managers in the world, and had just won a Premier League title with a rebuilt Chelsea just two seasons prior. And with his appointment to his club, his first transfer window, while typically belabored, was definitely a productive one. Big names like Zlatan Ibrahimovic, who he brought in on a free, and the return of the prodigal son, Pog Boom, near deadline day, were the two big highlights. Must be noted, after splashing 60 million on Angel Di Maria, they once again broke the bridge transfer fee, paying 89 million for their old player and Paul Pogba to return to Old Trafford. And they even had some underrating signs with the likes of Eric Bailly, who looked like a hyper-promising talent before injuries would kind of sap away a lot of his form. But with these reinforcements, the first season under Mourinho showed promise. They were able to capture two trophies, including the League Cup and a Europa League Cup win. Ibrahimovic, who came in on free, scored 28 goals in all competitions, which was enough for Zlatan to proclaim that he had came, saw, and conquered all of England. I guess? Now Jose's second transfer window would see even more fireworks spending, with Man United shelling out 75 million to reunite Romelu Lukaku with the manager that had once cast him out at Chelsea. The amount of money spent by this point honestly was outrageous. You couldn't really accuse the Glazers of letting the club debts get in the way of player transfers anymore. If anything, they were spending too much and had only minimal returns to show for it. Now Jose's second season was okay, but some of the cracks were already starting to show. After finishing sixth the year before, Jose did manage to finish second in the league, although it was a distant 19 points off of league winners Manchester City. Also, to rub salt further into the wounds, Manchester City won playing Pep's attractive tiki-taka style, while Man United had Jose and Mourinho. So they were parking the bus all the time, and they still finished 19 points off the league leaders. Yeah, fans fans weren't that happy. And that's not so much on Glazers, they're the ones signing the checks, but the man making the transfers, that's Woodward. And while he was finally able to sign the big marquee names, he once again failed to have much understanding of roster construction. Jose Mourinho is a defensive coach who tends to need excellent center backs to make his system work. And instead he got Jose a talented, but often injured Eric Bailly, and then the next window, he got Victor Lindelof. Now, Ed, I know the offensive players are sexy and they sell kits, but you got one of the best defensive minded managers of all time, and you gave him Victor Lindelof. You went to the Apple Store for offense and Walmart for defense. Think, Mark, think. And yes, there's a fair amount of blame to place on Jose during this era, but I beg you this question. If you made Pep starting center backs a pairing of Victor Lindelof and Eric Bailly, do you think he could have won the league that year? Now by this point, Manchester United had gone from a team who seemed like they were broke and unwilling to spend on players, to now hemorrhaging mad amounts of money in both transfers as well as ungodly weekly wages. And this was just exasperated as the rosters kept on needing to be rehauled for every time a new manager took over. And what was worse than Ed Woodward's recruitment strategy was his inability to move on Deadwood. The panic signing of Alexi Sanchez was a move made to save Jose Mourinho. A move that would see Alexi Sanchez essentially sit on the bench for three years, racking up an ungodly half a million dollars in weekly wages. Ed Woodward didn't sell him until the goddamn pandemic hit. And to make things worse, he let him go on a free. He didn't get anything from him. I mean, isn't this asshole supposed to be good with money? Like, that's the one thing he's supposed to be good at, right? Are we sure? Are we sure? And if Pep Guardiola at Man City wasn't bad enough in 2016, now the old rival 
was starting to stir. Yes, Liverpool were finally re-emerging as a footballing superpower. After being the team of the 80s, Liverpool had toiled in mediocrity for the past 30 years. But giving the reins over to Jurgen Klopp seemingly changed the fortunes of the club. Follow that up with the shrewd signings of players like Mo Salah, Sadio Mane, and Andrew Robertson, who might I add, all signed for a fraction of the price of what the Manchester teams were spending. And be it divine luck or expert scouting, many of these frugal signings would blossom into world-class players under Klopp. And this rapid evolution would turn Liverpool into contenders once more. And when they did finally splash the big bucks, it paid off big in the form of Virgil van Dijk. It wasn't long before Europe, and eventually England would fall before the marauding might. After the past decade of watching Manchester City becoming a footballing superpower, Man United fans now had to deal with the fact that Liverpool was now the best football team in the world. Until... Oops! Hey, don't get mad at me! I didn't do it! It was Pickford that did it! And it's also fair to point out that Liverpool's owners during this time are also American. Now, they're different from the Glazers of the Fenway Sports Group, who also own the Boston Red Sox. And I want to point this out because there's a lot of anti-American sentiment in ownership right now, for good reason. But we cannot deny the fact that Liverpool have done pretty well to get themselves a Champions League win and their first Premier League title ever under American ownership just a season ago. So being American isn't the factor. I would argue that the main difference is that they don't have their fucking accountant running their transfers. They actually are intelligent. They have a sporting director. Same with Mansoor over at Man City. And shockingly, look at them. They do better. They're spending both smarter and more efficiently. But yeah, back to Manchester United. So now you got Man City and Pep Guardiola walking the league and they got Jurgen Klopp and Liverpool absolutely killing it. Both of them playing attractive, attacking style of football. And then you got Jose Mourinho parking the bus, not really showing too much progress. And by season three, the writing was on the wall. Reports that Jose had lost the locker room. And shortly thereafter, in less than three seasons, Jose Mourinho's tenure at Manchester United was terminated. And the times, they were looking pretty bleak. Who could save Manchester United? Surrounded by powerful enemies on all sides, an accountant making transfers, and seemingly apathetic ownership. Could someone, could anyone, step up to save Manchester United? And the answer, well, who better than a man who had already saved Manchester United once before? Enter Ollie, Machine Gunner Solskjaer. When Ollie first took over, the team seemed to be lifted from a spell. His first match was a 5-1 hammering of Carter City, which was awesome and simultaneously depressing once you realized that this was the first time Manchester United had scored five goals since Sir Alex Ferguson retired. And from that offensive spark, for some reason, Manchester United became invincible under Ollie. His first five league games all wins. But his crowning achievement during this run would be a dramatic come from behind victory in second leg of the Champions League against PSG. With the help of VAR and a questionable handball call on Kimbepe, he gave a penalty in the dying moments of the game when Marcus Rashford stepped up and delivered this cold ass penalty, allowing Manchester United to advance in injury time. It was the first sense of true jubilation brought on by the pitch in almost a decade. And it was just nice to finally have a positive memory from this era that actually involved football and not a manager subbing himself in or a manager falling down. And all this was great, but honestly, it wasn't all pretty. Ollie was inexperienced. His tactics were green, often getting the initial setup wrong in big fixtures. But he was winning, and he's a club legend who played under Sir Alex Ferguson, and at the very least, he'll be bringing some of that old culture back to Old Trafford. And it showed the boys started to play a lot more attractive football. There was a rededication to youth development. Mason Greenwood started becoming more of a regular in the rotation, and Manchester United went on a lovely streak that would be known as the Ollie's at the Wheel era. And the good times are back, baby. Get the contract out, put it on the table, <laughs> yeah. let him sign it, let him write whatever numbers he wants to put on there, given what he's done now since he's come in, and let him sign the contract and go. Ollie's at the Wheel, man. He's doing it. He's doing his thing. Man United are back. Until the wheels came the fuck off. As meteoric as his rise was, the fall off was just as violent. Right back to earth, and maybe soon to be six feet under. 
Manchester United opened with a horrid run at the start of the next season, and then another lackluster start in the season after gave us the infamous sacked in the morning moment. It was really touch and go. Ollie could have been sacked multiple times, but he weathered the storm till last January. And little did we all know, but another young man from Portugal would come and change the fates of Manchester United once again. Bruno Fernandes came from the Portuguese league, where he was bagging goals and assists for fun. But there were some questions on whether he could make it in the more physically demanding Premier League. That answer was an emphatic yes. He took to the Premier League like an 18-year-old e-girl takes to OnlyFans. Money from day one. Bruno Fernandes on the pitch was honestly everything that Manchester United fans had hoped Paul Pogba would be. A talismanic maestro who took games by the scruff of the neck. After spending a billion pounds, Ed Woodward had finally gotten one. Very, very right. His fiery attitude and drive to win was infectious. Combine that with his creativity, his technical ability, and the cojones to try and pull off some truly audacious shit. And he very well could have saved Ollie Gunnar Solskjaer's job. And then you combine that with the blossoming of Mason Greenwood, Luke Shaw finally hitting his career mode potential. And at the end of this current 2021 season, Man United found themselves a resurgent second place. And they made it as far as the Europa League final. Still quite far from the trouble winning standards of almost two decades ago, but at the very least, it was the most promising and probably the most entertaining season since Sir Alex Ferguson has left. Things were finally kind of looking up. And then the Super League happened. There was this interesting study done to figure out which political scandals tend to stick. And the interesting thing that they found was the ones that actually landed were the scandals that already confirmed a suspicion or reputation of the figure in question. The feeling around the Glazers has always been that they own and run Manchester United for profit. And the history says as much, with reportedly the family taking out $1 billion out of the accounts of Manchester United with zero evidence of them ever putting in any of their own money. And as we've seen, Ed Woodward was always more interested in securing shirt deals than player deals. So when this Super League fiasco went down, what do you think it confirmed? Yeah, every fear and suspicion that fans have ever had about the Glazers and Ed Woodward, boom, laid bare, mask off, no one was even hiding anymore. And yeah, we should have known. The signs were all there. It still boggles my mind that it took this man two years to understand the offside rule. I taught my girl the offside rule in two minutes. It's not that hard. You just need to give a fuck. And this is the guy who thinks the Super League is a good idea. These are some of the dumbest billionaires I have ever heard of. Or more likely, they didn't really give a fuck as long as the money kept flowing in. So when the idea of no longer needing to qualify for the Champions League came up, and you tell these greedy fucks that it would guarantee them $135 million every year compared to the 83 they would get from actually putting out effort to qualify, what do you think a billionaire is gonna say? Joel Glazer, who puts his name on nothing, goes ahead and co-chairs this and releases a statement in support. This man, who owns the most successful club in English history, would gladly see a famine on English football if it meant lining his own family pockets more regularly. When asked why would they attempt to ruin football for the country who gave us the sport, the Glazers responded, Cause fuck them, that's why. They simply have no clue or don't care to understand football that isn't Americana. They've won two Super Bowls as owner of the Tampa Bay Bucks, so they care enough to appoint someone competent over there. But at United, they had Woodward. And instead of working hard to secure maybe the signings of Erlen Holland, they've apparently been working behind the backs of UEFA to secure funding for the Super League. Sadly, there are kids today that don't know anything else but a Glazer-owned Manchester United. Now it's like an old folks tale when Manchester United used to be good. But they look at Old Trafford now and what do they see? A hollowed out husk of her former glory. A team that used to challenge for trebles are now happy to just qualify for the Champions League. The biggest trophy they've won since Sir Alex Ferguson left is the Europa League. And that's great if you're Tottenham, not Manchester United. And I throw that dig at Tottenham, but I don't even feel right saying it anymore because here's the honest truth. Manchester United are closer to Tottenham than they are to Man City. They become a second tier club in England. And the custodians of this club, they don't care. They're billionaire c**ts living an ocean away who just won the Super Bowl for their American fans. They are insulated from all this chaos and criticism that they themselves caused, which is the most infuriating thing about this. I'm American and I'm upset. I can't even imagine what you guys are feeling over in the UK. But to these people, the Glazers, you gotta understand their family business is owning sports franchises. To them, Manchester United 
isn't some jewel to be treasured, it's just a subsidiary. And just the audacity to try to pull off the Super League, to try to ruin football, the one bit of normalcy we've had in this hellish year and a half. They thought that this was when fans would lay down and take it? The disconnect between the Glazers and the common fan is just unimaginable. At this point, I think Israel and Palestine will understand each other before the Glazers understand Manchester United. So please, God, sell. Bezos, I'm begging you buy this shit because the glazers are just gonna sit pretty over here and i highly doubt they're gonna go venture across the pond anytime soon so now you can understand the fans and why they rushed old trafford the other day 16 years ago it would be unthinkable that fans would protest to stop a liverpool versus manchester united match but this is what it is this is 16 years of frustration coming to a head 16 years of being unheard and when everyone else was experiencing a once in a lifetime plague these owners wanted to rip out the soul of football right out of the country that gave birth to it. Shang Tsung style, Edward Cullen style, New Moon style, Twilight style. So the story of the fall of Manchester United begins and it should end with the Glazers. And Ed Woodward was an extension of their incompetence, not the exception. And yes, he's stepped down, he's gone away, but, but you know how this goes. Like a dark Sith Lord, another one will rise up from the ranks to take his place. And if we're not careful, it's just gonna be darker and more sinister than the last. The Glazers have just demonstrated again and again a fundamental misunderstanding of what the fuck they bought. And that's what leads us to today. A family who never understood the emotional attachment of a sports team owns one of the most sentimental sports teams in world history. This was never gonna work out well. And yes, maybe they can attempt to turn it around, invest heavily into names like Holland, Sancho, maybe even bring back Cristiano Ronaldo for good PR, all in an attempt to just say, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're so sorry. And yeah, Liverpool's owners have proven that American ownership can restore an English giant back to their former glory. But we are in Liverpool. So to the Glazers, if you wanna know how every Manchester United fan feels about you, here's a clip. Let me tell you something, you fucking American. Get the fuck out my club and go back to fucking America. Yeah. Oh. And yeah, that's the depressing conclusion to this video. I hope I provided some levity in making fun of all this bullshit that's happened over the past decade of misery. If you enjoyed this video, if you'd like to have more input on uh, what videos I make next, please go ahead and throw me a dollar on Patreon every month. For less than a cup of coffee, it'll be really helping me out, fight off the cockroaches that are in my bedroom. This video literally would have gotten out a lot quicker if a cockroach didn't run across my keyboard. I'd have like fucking bombed my room for a week. Yeah, actually, don't even donate if you enjoy the content, you just want to support me. Donate to help me commit a genocide on these fucking roaches. And for that, I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need money. But, let's be honest, what's in it for you? You're gonna see your name at the end of the video, which is always dope, bro. Like, don't lie to yourself. Every person I'm a patron of, go to the end of the video, see my name in the end, and I'm like, yeah, I helped make this. Or, you know, if you're hurting, man, just leave a like, that's free, and it uh, helps me in this godforsaken algorithm. But yeah, that's uh, pretty much gonna be it from me. Till next time, boys, stay safe, and stay fucking thin.